Hello everyone and welcome back to AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. Today we're going to continue on with our discussion from Unit 1, just the basics of geography, talking about the nature of ge geography and geographic study and the perspectives that we need in order to accomplish that. So today we're going to start with the five themes of spatial perspective, also called the five themes of geography. So you can see here there are five. We have location, human environment, interaction, region, place, and movement. And these are really just five different ways that we can consider geography, uh, consider the study of geography, and people and the way that they interact with their space. So the first one we're going to talk about is location because as we discussed in our previous video, we talked about this whole idea of the why of where. So if we're going to talk about the why of where, first thing we need to do is to discuss uh, the where portion. How do we describe the where? So we're going to talk about location. So again, basically we're just talking about you know where in the world is something located. Uh, and so when we look at where is something located, this is going to have a great impact on a lot of the events uh, that are taking place across the world, especially as it pertains to whether it's the topography of the land, the climate of the land, or the culture of the place uh, in which something is taking place. So there are two ways that we describe the the actual physical location of something or an event and uh, you have what's called absolute location and relative location and those are the two we're going to focus on for this particular video uh, and then there are two ways that we can describe a location itself or the characteristics of a location that's called site and situation and they're very similar to, to, to absolute and relative location um, they're just some nuanced differences so we're going to go over absolute and relative location uh, today so the first thing we're going to talk about is absolute location. How do we determine what is absolute location? So absolute location is very important because uh, it gives us a precise mathematical location that exists on the Earth. So basically what has happened is, is we as humans have taken the globe and we have, uh, if you look at a piece of graph paper, it looks almost like graph paper. Uh, we've taken lines of latitude and longitude and we've laid it across the Earth's surface so that regardless of who is discussing a point on the Earth, we can all come to terms with or we can all understand uh, where that place is. It's a standardization. It's just like any other standardized unit of measure, whether we're talking about a pound or an inch or an hour or a second or whatever. Uh, we all understand what that standardized measurement is, and it allows everyone around the world to, to understand where that location is at. Uh, and again, it's a location on this global grid. Now we have to understand that this global grid does not actually exist in the real world. Uh, it's something that we've created to help us understand the placement of things. And so, uh, you know, if you were looking at the actual world, you would not see lines of latitude and longitude on the Earth's surface. It's just, it's, it's just another uh, element of organization and categorization that we as humans have developed to help us understand places. So when we talk about absolute location, uh, like I said, we're going to use lines of latitude, we're going to use lines of longitude in order to find that absolute location. That helps us to find what are called the coordinates of a place on the Earth's surface. Uh, so first we'll start with lines of latitude. And again, hopefully you've had some experience with this some, in some of your previous schooling, so this will not be uh, incredibly in-depth or anything like that. So we have lines of latitude. Uh, these are going to be lines that run parallel to the equator. And so when we talk about lines of north and south degrees latitude, it's talking about whether it is north of the equator. So here you see on this example that I have, this will be 15 degrees north, 30 degrees north, so forth and so on. This will be 15 degrees south uh, of the equator. That's going to be our starting point. Now, we call them parallels because they run parallel to the equator, but they are lines that run horizontal uh, and they measure degrees north and south. So even, even though they run east to west, they're going to measure degrees north and south, um, north and south of of the uh, of the globe or the equator. Sorry. All right. Then we have our lines of longitude. Okay. We also call them meridians, and the reason we call them meridians is because they run parallel to the prime meridian. The prime meridian uh, you know, runs through Greenwich, England. That's zero degrees uh, zero degrees longitude. Um, now, when I had uh, some students earlier and a couple of years ago, and they were, we were talking about some different ways that we could remember lines of latitude and longitude and, you know, what way they moved or how they lied, uh, one student told me, uh, Mr. Elrod, well, latitude is flatitude. So if you think about lines of latitude lying flat across the earth's surface and if you are, uh, you know, lying horizontal, and if you think about longitude is longitude, I don't know if that helps at all. Uh, so they're running, uh, they, they run north and south, but they measure degrees east and west. So they are vertical, uh, and they do measure degrees east and west. And we're talking about east and west of the prime meridian. So again, this 20 degrees here would be 20 degrees west, 40 degrees west, uh, 40 degrees east, 20 degrees east of the, of the prime meridian, and so forth and so on. 
And so uh, that's how we use the, the lines of latitude and longitude. So if we put those all together, now this is, of course, not an incredibly precise map uh, that we can look at, but it gives you an idea. And one of the most important things probably when we talk about lines of latitude and longitude is it allows you to get a general idea of where things are located if you're given a set of coordinates. Um, you should be able to put something within a particular quadrant. So, you know, you see here, here's the line, here's our equator, okay, here's our prime meridian. Uh, if you're given a set of coordinates, you should know, you know, does it lie over here, kind of North America, Central America, Northern and Southern South America, you know, does it lie over here in Africa, Asia, so forth and so on. And, and, and so it should just, you be, should be able to picture in your mind where something is generally located on the Earth based upon a set of coordinates uh, that you were given. Now, if we're talking about lines of latitude and longitude, the way that they're measured is you have uh, degrees, minutes and seconds uh, depending on how precise you're going to get and typically for school uh, you know in just general application you're probably just going to see degrees and you might get into minutes very rarely would you get into seconds you might see this uh, with some of your uh, GPS monitors or maybe on Google Earth or Google Maps or something you might see something along those lines but just so that you're aware uh, with uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds, you have 60, it's just almost just like time, you have 60 minutes in a degree and 60 seconds in a minute. So you know that the closer you are to 60, the closer you are to the next degree in terms of minutes, and then the cl in seconds, the, clo the high, closer you are to 60, the closer you are to the next uh, minute in terms of from seconds to minutes. So what that might look like, and I apologize for how this probably won't look right because I'm doing it with my mouse. So if you saw a set of coordinates or a coordinate that said maybe 45 degrees, 45, and then degrees would be written in a little circle just like temperatures. Uh, 45 degrees, I don't know, let's say 15 minutes. Oops, doesn't look very good, I'm sorry. Uh, and then just be a little tick mark, and then, I don't know, let's say it's uh, 58 seconds. Okay, 58 seconds would be two tick marks. And let's just say that's in north. Okay. So obviously you know that lies somewhere in between 45 degrees and 46 degrees north uh, north latitude. Okay, just so that you are aware of how that is written. Now, so it would be good maybe if you got a map or with some lines of latitude and longitude and started practicing that. Maybe your teacher could give you uh, an activity to help you practice the use of those, uh, those coordinates. Now, aside from coordinates and locations on the Earth, there's another way that we use lines of longitude, and that is the creation of our time zones. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but there are actually 24 time zones on the Earth's surface uh, that divide up the Earth into the 24 hours a day when it set, rises in the east and sets in the west. Um, and I say here we start the prime meridian because uh, you know that is our zero degrees. That is going to be our zero degrees uh, longitude, and so you can uh, you know add hours and subtract hours based upon where you are uh, from the prime meridian. Uh, and that should be we are using lines of longitude. I thought I had changed that, but apparently not. Sorry. We're going to use lines of longitude. to get our uh, our time zones. And when we talk about time zones, you're going to move into a new time zone every 15 degrees longitude. So every 15 degrees longitude is going to be a new time zone moving forward or backward. Uh, one hour. Now the main reason for developing the time zones really is about economics and scheduling and helping people to create a standardized form of telling time uh, and knowing what time it is in one part of the world to the next. And so globalization as we've discussed is really going to play a key part in this especially as uh, countries start uh, trading with one another uh, and so that you can get the schedules right especially for boats and for trains as they're coming and planes as they're coming and going uh, and people are going to be boarding those trains, boats, and planes, uh, and moving from one country to the next. Now, this right here just gives you kind of an idea of where the different uh, time zones are located in the world. And you'll notice that even though we, we want to think about lines of latitude and longitude as straight lines, and lines of longitude are straight in terms of the way that we draw them out on maps, you notice that the time zones are not necessarily straight up and down with the countries. And a lot of them actually follow country borders. And especially if the country is small enough, a lot of that has to do with trying to keep the whole country on one time zone. Now you'll see some some anomalies over here like China. Uh, China is actually all in one time zone. Uh, and I believe it's five time zones. Let's count here. We have uh, really maybe one, two, three, four, 
five, yeah, so about five time zones in China. And so you think about the difficulty of the Chinese people in trying to uh, trying to go about their day. So once the sun rises in the east, far east here over in China, maybe a little bit more further north than Manchuria or so, uh, it's going to be another five hours before the sun rises in <clears throat> the most western portion of China. And the same thing, you're going to have another five hours of daylight when it's already dark over in the far eastern portion of China. So you can imagine how difficult that might be. Um, and then down here in Venezuela, down here in Venezuela, you've had uh, a situation where um, where Hugo Chavez actually decided that he was not going to follow uh, this, the time zone that the other countries around him are in. I think he moved it forward or backward about 30 minutes. So it's going to be something that the country itself has to decide that's going to follow. But again, a lot of that has to do with trying to standardize times for economics and for scheduling. And so uh, that's going to end our conversation on, uh, on uh, absolute location. Now we're going to move on to relative location. So as you saw there, uh, absolute location is discussing precise mathematical points on the Earth's surface. Relative location is much more personal, uh, and it really has nothing to do with the point on the Earth's surface. It has everything to do with the things that are surrounding the actual uh, place or event that you're trying to describe. Uh, so one thing about absolute location is that absolute location, every place has one absolute location on the Earth. That is not necessarily the same for relative location. So you can see the definition there says the relative location of a place is based upon its surroundings. And it can change. The relative location of something can change over time, whereas absolute location does not change. It's going to stay the same over time. Now, it's going to, the relative location of something can change uh, based upon a couple of different things. Number one, it can change on based upon the person uh, or the perspective in which you are coming at a particular place or location. So I have down here at the bottom uh, the big chicken. This is in Marietta, Georgia. And uh, those who are from that area would, would probably readily recognize this. And this is something that almost is always used as a landmark as people are driving in and through Marietta and people will talk about where they are in relationship to the big chicken. So they talk about their position relative to the big chicken or you can talk about where something is uh, in relationship to the big chicken. You say, well, keep going past the big chicken and it will be up on your left. And so you can see that relative location is something that we typically use in our everyday life as opposed to uh, those things like absolute location. I have up here a map of the University of Georgia. A lot of people where I'm from are University of Georgia fans. Uh, and so I figured I'd throw a map up here of that. And so let's say you were trying to get to Stegman Coliseum. Okay, and we were using relative location. Well, if you're coming from, I'm going to assume that this is, let's say you were coming from the Veterinary Medicine Building. Uh, you know, you would you would give somebody directions based upon the Veterinary Medicine uh, vet medicine Building. So the Stegman Coliseum in relationship to the veteran, Veterinary Medicine Building is is one particular location. But let's say maybe I'm uh, at the baseball game and then I'm going to go catch something going on at the Stegman Coliseum. So Stegman Coliseum in relationship to Folly Field is going to be a little bit different. So you see how the relative location of Stegman Coliseum is going to change based upon uh, whether I'm coming from the baseball field or the veterinary medicine building, and so that can change, and so it can create, uh, you know, it can create some confusion based upon the things that you are familiar with, and it can also change as the area changes. Um, I know in the area that I live, there's been a lot of changes with roads and development, things like that, and so uh, as new landmarks come about, as roads change. Uh, the relative location of a place is going to change. We just had uh, our next to our school, we had a large shopping development uh, go in. And so now our school, you can say that our school is south of the avenues at Forsyth. Uh, Ten years ago, you couldn't say that we, because, because the development wasn't there. But now because it's been built there relative to uh, the avenues, we are our school is south of the avenues. Uh, and then if you think about the different side of town that you're on, you're going to be more or less familiar with certain sides of town. And so with different buildings or neighborhoods or businesses or whatever. Uh, and so you're going to give different uh, landmarks. You're going to give different sets of directions based upon what you know as well. And so relative location can be highly personal and certainly not going to be as precise as, um, as absolute location.